new IEE is an institute of the Edison Foundation focused on advancing the adoption of innovative and efficient new technologies among electric utilities and their technology partners that will transform the power grid. You just have to fly into any city at night and you look at all of the points of light out there and realize that every single one of those points of light is connected to a wire that's connected to one of our generators and you realize how central this industry is to our economy and to our way of life. This industry had its giants at its beginning, so the Edisons, the Westinghouse, the Latimers, they all started to build this infrastructure into something that became universal. There would be no reason for Google if you didn't have computers. You can't have computers without electricity. And so it's that interrelation that is driving innovations in the economy. New technologies have started to blur the distinction between end user efficiency and utility operations, where power flows from central generating stations to end user sites. With the smart grid, we're basically creating two-way flows of both power and information between power sources and end-user sites. It represents a great opportunity because now we will be able to integrate new technologies, new innovations that have been developed over the last several decades and integrate them into this new and improved grid that will take us forward for the next 100 years. That means upgrading the power grid using the technology to transform the power grid and driving innovation that benefits consumers. This is a tremendous opportunity. We can see that this technology will work. Uh, it's really up to us to be able to integrate it all, make sure that we're dealing with our basic responsibility of reliable service, but also to really grow into uh, this type of innovation that's all around us. Our industry will be at the center of creating this nation's energy future and making sure that the lifeblood of our economy, which is electricity, continues to be available to all Americans. As executive director of IEE, I have the privilege of working with so many dedicated people, engineers, regulators, businessmen, policymakers, all dedicated to changing the way that electricity is generated, delivered, and managed. We're going to have to elevate our own game. We're going to have to bring new resources, new ideas, uh, new ways of looking at things. It's a tremendously exciting time. Nobody knows what the future is going to be like, but one thing I am very confident in predicting is that this industry will be at the center of creating this nation's energy future and making sure that the lifeblood of our economy, which is electricity, continues to be available to all Americans. Just over a hundred years ago, this industry placed its stamp on the world. We changed the standard of living by introducing electricity to everyday life. We're going to get to do it again. Good morning and welcome to the night studio. I'm Lisa Wood, Executive Director of IEE and Institute of the Edison Foundation. Thank you for joining us for IEE's Informing the Future. I hope you enjoyed the video featuring Tony Early, the Chairman, CEO, and President of PG&E Corporation and former Chair of the Edison Foundation, and Joe Rigby, the Chairman, President, and CEO of Pepco Holdings, here with us on the panel today and a member of the IEE Management Committee. This is the beginning of a very exciting time for the electric power industry and our customers. As you know, electric utilities are upgrading the power grid with a digital information and telecommunications network. These smart new technologies are beginning to deliver efficiency-related benefits on both sides of the meter. These benefits include not only a reduction in power losses from generator to consumer, but also the capability to send price signals to consumers, to, delete, to detect power outages instantly, to automatically redirect power in the case of system problems, and to provide energy management information to consumers. These are just some examples. As a result, energy efficiency, or more broadly speaking, energy productivity, is becoming tightly related to other utility functions. With the blurring of this distinction between customer and utility functions, 
IEE is broadening its focus to go beyond increasing efficiency on the customer side of the meter. We are now focused on, on advancing the adoption of innovative and efficient technologies among electric utilities, smart grid technology companies, regulators, and other stakeholders that will transform the power grid. This means sharing information, ideas, and experiences, fostering collaboration, and identifying policies that support the business case for the adoption of cost-effective technologies. As you know, change does not occur without the insights and, and contributions of many people. This was certainly true in forming the new IEE, which we are launching today. I would like to recognize a few key people that helped us make the new IEE happen. Both Michael Yakira, the president and CEO of Envy Energy and former chair of IEE, and Bob Rowe, the president and CEO of Northwestern Energy and co-chair of IEE, also on the panel today, provided their thoughts, their insights, and their direction throughout this process. Thank you, Michael and Bob. Finally, I would like to especially recognize and thank one person that worked with me every step of the way in creating the new IEE. Pete Delaney, the chairman, president, and CEO of OGE Energy Corporation and co-chair of IEE. It is my great pleasure today to introduce Pete Delaney to provide opening remarks for today's event. Pete. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. It's great to be here today. A pleasure to be here to recognize the expansion of IE's mission into advancing technologies as well as efficiency in the electric utility industry. It's also great to have a beautiful vista of Oklahoma City behind me with the mountains and uh, all those points of light that Tony early talked about. But I want to kick this off, talking about, uh, spend a few minutes talking about why this is an important undertaking for the utility industry. Innovation, as you may know, has always been an important part of our history and has really allowed us to meet a lot of the challenges we've had in the past. And of course, the same reliance on innovation holds true today. Although many things change, many things stay the same, increase in cost driven by more regulation, by tighter emission standards, by equipment, cost, re equipment replacement costs much higher than the depreciated equipment on our books. However, we now face additional challenges, or as we look at it, actually opportunities associated with the evolving consumer role, such as the efficient integration of more and more distributed resources on the power grid. IE's mission to promote thought leadership and collaboration related to driving innovation and in the adoption of efficient technologies in the electric power sector is of critical importance to us. IE will do this through a combination of discussions, forums, and short-term fo focused policy research projects. IE believes an important part of achieving its objectives is by engaging the key stakeholders, in this case, utility executives, regulators, technology providers, and other thought leaders. I want to differentiate the IE mission from EPRI an industry-sponsored research and development nonprofit organization focused on the generation, delivery, and the use of electricity. There may be some of our uh, EPRI colleagues here today, and IE does collaborate with EPRI, but uh, I want to make clear that IE is not an R&D organization. Innovation, on the other hand, comes from integrating new technologies into our operations and adopting regulatory mechanisms that support as opposed to thwart innovation. And that integration is underway today. Many different approaches to integrating new control, sensor, and communi communicating technologies into the business are being uh, undertaken to address each specific situation of the utilities. IE can play an important role in promoting innovation by facilitating the sharing and exchange of information and experiences about these new approaches with key shareholders. As utilities, our R&D budgets are limited but we're well aware that keeping pace with consumers' expect expectations for value and optionality cannot be done without the dozens of technology companies we are working with today. IEE will continue to bring technology partners directly into conversations with utility executives to discuss critical issues and solutions. In fact, IEE launched in 2012 its technology partner program and already has 25 partners. Realizing the importance of technology uh, partners program is one of the reasons we decided to expand the IEE mission. I cannot emphasize enough the impact the role of regulation on the rate of innova innovation in the industry and the opportunity for IEE to make a difference. We do have Bob Rowe 
on the panel who, who used to serve as a state regulator, and we'll have some questions for him to how regulation can help us uh, support innovation. But innovation and regulation, you know, would not normally come up in a game of word association. Uh, but IE needs really help to figure this out because we need regulation that supports innovation to make all this work for us. Regulatory and key stakeholder support is dependent upon utilities working with others to demonstrate the value proposition of these technology-enhanced approaches. IE will be playing a critical role in terms of ensuring a sharing of information and results of the numerous disparate efforts uh, to derive value from smart grid investments underway. Information share, sharing is a critical part of continuous learning, and that information has real value to our industry. What is at stake? I don't know if our challenges are any greater today than in the past, but I do know the customer preferences for smaller and faster energy sources are driving up the demand for electricity and dependence on electricity is growing. In fact, uh, electricity is becoming more and more vital as we know that infrastructure runs an important part of our economy. Industries and resources that run electricity now account for 60% of GDP and account for 85% of GDP growth. Bottom line, reliable and reasonably priced electricity is becoming more and more important. The response of customers to the outages associated with major storms, particularly in the Northeast, may be a testimonial to the growing importance of electricity in people's lives. Electricity runs every aspect of our lives. I would say that historically, most innovation in the power sector has been focused on the supply side of the business and has been more or less invisible to our customers. We continue to see an abundance of opportunities to drive efficiency in operations that remain invisible to our customers but manifest themselves in lower than otherwise prices and in better service. With today's smart meter technology, that is no longer the case. On the customer side, the smart and smart grid refers to smart customers getting relevant and timely information with which to make choices. Today we can provide timely information reliably and affordably. Furthermore, our ability to optimize our own operations and make the most effective use of our resources is dependent upon partnering with our customers. If customers use electricity wisely, we can produce it more wisely. In addition, we are seeing dramatic improvements in customer satisfaction as customers get in more control of their energy destiny. A dramatic change in the relationship with the customer is coming at OG&E. We are already seeing a dramatic change in our relationship with customers as more and more customers gain control of their, how they track, manage, and pay for electricity use. The industry is at a critical point in our smart grid integration with a critical mass of investment now in place. There are over 40 million smart meters installed, and this does not include all the technology that goes between the smart meters and the power plants. But we are still in the early stages. The investment is just the beginning part of this journey. Now we must drive the value of those investments for our customers and share those successes with other key stakeholders. The electric utility industry continues to be committed to the adoption of new technologies and approaches to position our grid for the 21st century and beyond. You will hear from the panel this morning some examples of a change underway. We envision significant change in our industry. The timeline and the pace associated with this evolution remains unclear at this time. What is perfectly clear is that the power grid is too important not to get it right that collaboration remains a key to our successful transformation of the industry and that IEE can play an important role in that collaboration. Now we're going to move over and have a, a talk, discussion with our panel. Each panelist will uh, spend three minutes and I'm going to introduce them. Uh, first we have uh, to my immediate left is Joe Rigby, who's the president and chairman and CEO of Pepco Holdings, our hometown, hometown boy. Uh, <laughs> Next, we have uh, Terry Goddard, president of Siemens Smart Grid US and IEE Roundtable partner. Uh, next to him is Trevor Lauer, vice president of distribu distribution operations, DT Energy chair and I chair of IEE St strategy committee. Of course, Lisa Wood, who you've met, and Bob Rowe, president and CEO of Northwestern Energy and IEE co-chair and former state regulator. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I find that interesting background. <laughs> uh, let's start with uh, uh, Trevor, if I could. At DTE, uh, you've well along the way in terms of investment and moving into uh, smart meters and 
putting in control and sensor and communicating technologies. Um, how are you planning and how are you showing the, the value of those investments at this time or sometime in the near future? Yeah, good question. We talk a lot at DT about making the base business better for our customers with the smart grid. Uh, though we see a lot of improvements around energy efficiency and other enhancements where our customers can understand how they use it, we really focus on the base business. So let me give you a couple examples on how we see it really manifesting itself for the customer first and then on the utility side. First, when you think about meter reads, one of the things that our customers are irritated by is estimated reads. With AMI meters in place, we get 99.6% of our monthly reads accurate and on time. So we've virtually eliminated the needs for estimated reads, which is a big issue for our customers. Uh, the second one is we talk a lot about restoration, and you talked about it, Pete, in the beginning, but we talk at DT about restore before repair. Well, by, in, by uh, putting smart circuits in and smart meters in, it gives us the ability through relays and switches to uh, get customers' circuits back on faster and get customers' power back on faster during restoration events. A good example that we recently had during Hurricane Sandy was um, trouble behind trouble. So we had our AMI meters out, we would restore a circuit. There may still be trouble behind that one event where a line came down to the service to a particular home. With our, our AMI meters, they ping us back now and tell us that we still have one or two customers that are out uh, in an isolated area. So we can deploy our crews back faster, get our customers' restoration back faster. Another area we're focusing on is remote connects and disconnects. <coughs> Uh, previously, it would take us 24 hours to connect a customer to our electrical system, a residential business customer. With AMI meters, we can do that now in minutes when a customer wants to connect to our system. When police and fire need us to disconnect a customer for an emergency situation, we've had a couple of those, we're also able to do that remotely. Uh, we've managed to reduce 200,000 truck rolls in the last 24 months on our system alone. So not only does it make the process better, but it lowers the cost for our customers also. And then I'll mention one big benefit from the utility side, and that's injuries. So uh, one of the things we talk a lot about is OSHA recordable injuries, and you're not putting your meter readers in harm's way. We talk a lot about slip trips and falls, uh, injuries that our meter readers get, uh, dog bites, it may seem like it's something silly, but we get a lot of injuries with our workers doing that. And by implementing AMI meters at our residents uh, and at our customer sites, we can virtually eliminate most of that. So that's the way we're looking at it from a base business standpoint. Trevor, can you take a couple minutes just to tell us about your background and what you're thinking about innovation <laughs> as the industry as a whole? And, um, sure, sure. So, um, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Well, you know, the electric utility industry and our partners have been innovating for so long, for 100 years. When you think about hydroelectric power to geothermal power to nuclear to today's wind farms that you see being built, and especially in Detroit where I'm from, uh, you see the electric vehicles really taking off. So innovation between the utility industry and our partners has been huge to drive the benefits forward for our customers. That's not enabled if it isn't for the robustness of our electric grid. So at DTE, when we talk about innovation around the smart grid, uh, we have a program we call Smart Currents, and it really has three pieces to our Smart Currents program. The first is AMI meters or smart meters. We've deployed a million smart meters with the plan to deploy about 3.6 million to cover all of our meters, our residential and commercial meters across our two utilities. We have smart circuits, which is uh, an interplay of smart devices, relays and switches, which allow us to move power automatically in case of restoration events. And the third is smart home, where we're doing some pilot programs with customers to understand how customers react to real-time pricing signals so we have programs like a prepay program, a dynamic peak pricing program, smart appliances, different ways that we can send pricing signals to the customer, see how they react, how much energy they save, and how the consumption patterns change. So that's how we're, we're working at it from an innovation standpoint. Thank you, Trevor. Let's uh, turn to Terry for a minute. You know, you work with utilities across the country. Maybe you can share, no matter who you are, and share a couple of minutes, uh, sure. your thoughts about innovation industry, what you see, and. Right, so yes, I, I represent Siemens, one of the technology partners here, and uh, about 25 years of experience bringing technology to the power industry. And today, bring innovation to the power industry means really uh, building a good team, 
uh, a smart grid culture, which is very cross-functional. You have to have skills of software, IT, power systems, communication. So a lot of work in terms of uh, recruiting, training, and retaining uh, the best minds in the um, industry. In terms of rolling forward with innovation, we see it in two types. One is the um, adaptation of the grid to new technology, so more an evolution, a migration of existing systems to new technologies, such as adapting a, a database technology to read um, and to store meter data, or uh, adapting some of the um, communication technology IP network into a substation. And then you have disruptive technology, things that are game changer, things like uh, microgrids or storage or uh, controllable inverters, things that we didn't think about you know, a few years back that be become a new, new way of controlling the grid and implementing smart grid. So at Siemens, we, we pursue both, both type of innovation. As you work with many utilities across the country, what, what are you seeing as, what do you see as the major barriers and as we talk about yes. you know, advancing yeah. uh, IE innovation in, in the sector? Well, I mean, uh, beside the obvious, which is how you finance all this, uh, I think one, one barrier is, is utilities have not yet realized fully that the grid extends beyond the meters. And, and what behind, what's behind the meter, whether it's a, a, a home appliance, a microgrid, a, a solar panel, really extend the way you, you, you operate the grid and, and manage your, your, your business processes. So th that, that's one key element of, of smart grid that we see more and more. Um, I think that's, that's one of the major barrier is the new horizon of the grid. Um, other, other barriers is that uh, when you introduce innovation, you always deal with a um, legacy system and by the way, you have to implement or retrofit systems that are live. You know, it's not like you have the luxury to turn off the grid for several weeks and, and do your work. So there's a tight coordination between the, the technology partner and the utility in, in planning the outage and planning the resources. And that really increased the, the complexity of rolling out um, technology into the, into the grid. Good points. Bob, uh, I think we established your background, but you may <laughs> want to talk a little bit more about that. And, and as a CEO now, Northwest, could do, in that part of the country, you share a little bit about your views on, on innovation in the industry? Yeah, well, uh, I've been with Northwest for about four and a half years. Uh, among my uh, uh, past, I, I was a, a state regulator, very active nationally in telecommunications. And one of the challenges we have in this sector is focusing on uh, the investment in the basic infrastructure, understanding the opportunities, uh, but being fairly sober about what those opportunities are and identifying the risks. Uh, Northwestern is both a gas and, a, and an electric utility. We serve Montana, South Dakota, uh, natural gas in Nebraska, and a little bit of a beautiful little corner of Wyoming called Yellowstone Park. For a, a company with fewer than a, a million customers, we have a very, very large service territory. On the electric side, we have about 9,000 miles of transmission, operate a very large balancing authority with major points of interconnection uh, to the west in, in particular, uh, about 20,000 miles of distribution, uh, and just in our Montana operation, uh, over uh, 400,000 uh, power poles. So it's a big challenge. I think consistent with the other uh, uh, utility uh, participants in the panel, uh, we decided about uh, four years ago to focus very heavily on the basic infrastructure. Went out uh, and engaged an outside consultant to push us very hard. Uh, established a stakeholder group to have a conversation about what their expectations were as customers of the underlying distribution systems, both gas and electric systems that you really take for granted, can't live without. Uh, they created a vision for the distribution system. Uh, we then went through uh, several years of planning what we refer to as our distribution system infrastructure plan, our DSIP, again, both gas and electric. Uh, lots of uh, programmatic elements to both. Uh, the basic thing we want to do is stay on the right side of the uh, repair versus replace curve on all aspects uh, of, of our infrastructure. Uh, in terms of thinking about technology, there are major technology 
components of the DSIP, but there's an al also just a tremendous amount of blocking and tackling. It's substations, it's poles, it's overhead, it's underground, it's clearance. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, technology specifically, what we decided to do was adopt a couple of themes. One is uh, to make the system ready for uh, a more ubiquitous deployment of technology. Uh, second was to uh, be sure we were taking what in telecoms uh, we used to refer to as a no barriers approach. Uh, if the infrastructure, basic infrastructure isn't in place, uh, isn't adequate, it really doesn't uh, make much difference what kind of technology you're deploying over the top of that. So make ready uh, and no barriers and then uh, fundamentally to deploy uh, as we understood the technology, as we understood the business case, as we understood what, uh, what customers ultimately want. So we've been going, we're just finishing up two years of ramp up uh, to our DSIP. Now we're going into five years of full uh, production. Uh, again, there are communications elements on our side of the meter as part of the program. Uh, we view our business technology team as core to basically every project that we do as a company. And then at the same time, we're participating in the Pacific Northwest uh, smart grid pilot program as a way to understand uh, all of the different uh, future elements of smart grid and, and how those elements uh, can be uh, brought to bear ultimately to do what, what customers conclude they want to do. And that's what we'll learn through the pilot. Bob, you're a highly rural service territory. Does that, you know, as opposed to like behind you, the Oklahoma City grid I was pointing out, does that does that offer any unique challenges? It, it does, and we have, a, uh, we, we have a very uh, diverse uh, service territory and, and kind of a skew. Uh, most of our uh, customers are, are concentrated in what we would call uh, urban areas, uh, but we have, we have large parts of our service territory, uh, particularly in Montana, where rather than customers per mile, it's miles per customer. Uh, those lines are often uh, very exposed up over the mountains. They're subject to uh, forest fires and blizzards, and this fall we had them. We had uh, 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 crews that were out uh, dealing with fires, and a week later dealing with the first snowstorms of the season. So often these are radial lines, a lot of exposure, and there's some real opportunities. Uh, again, uh, pay attention to the basic blocking and tackling, and use technology to improve reliability for those customers as well. Thank you, Bob. Joe, as CEO of Pepco, what are your, you have any overall views and, on innovation before we get into the question for you, uh, innovation in the sector and sure. what the barriers are and yes, I how do. you see that moving forward? Right, I'm Joe Rigby, uh, welcome to our uh, service territory. I'll give you a little bit of, uh, we didn't arrange the win last night with the Redskins, that wasn't just for you. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not a regulator, but I understand Bob is. Um, the, uh, just a little bit of background about our company. Um, we actually have, three utilities. We serve about 1.9 million customers, just under 800,000 here uh, for Pepco, both in the district as well as within two adjoining counties in Maryland. Um, we, just this past month, we installed our one millionth smart meter. So we're about halfway there. And I think more broadly, when we think of innovation, there's kind of three words that come to mind for me anyway. Um, one is, is knowledge. Uh, customers demand knowledge, almost in instantaneous. In fact, the gap between whatever the event is to them being informed is just shrinking dramatically. Uh, they have every expectation that they're not going to get estimated bills. They expect that we would know when they're out of power. They would expect that we would be able to communicate relatively soon thereafter as to when they should expect restoration because they want to obviously plan their lives. Um, and there's just a whole other range of knowledge, of usage, of prices, and we can get into that. The other thing that comes to mind is the word policy. We can't do this alone. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded when I think back to our evolution, uh, we, were, we were tracking and looking at technology evolving uh, very, as you would expect we do, uh, but around the 2005 and 6 time frame, we felt that the technology had matured enough that we could move ahead and, and make decisions with regard to smart meters, but also to make sure that we were integrating outage management system, a, a communication technology back from the field. If you think of a meter as just a, as a sensor now, and being able to communicate back to system control, ultimately to our call center, such that we could communicate and provide that knowledge to our customers. At around the same time, we, we saw, at least in our service territory, what we called rate caps came off and the price of the commodity went up dramatically and there was a very strong political and media and, and, and at, the, at the top of that list a customer reaction as to the cost of energy going up. 
Um, and throughout that came uh, a, a series of policy steps, which included uh, very, very clear uh, goals to reduce consumption over a period of time. So we knew that we couldn't do that unless we had the ability to communicate much more directly with our customers and give them the wherewithal to make energy uh, consumption decisions. The third thing we think about is pace. Um, you know, Bob talked about the nature of his service territory. I have, I have a very, in parts of my service territory, it's very rural. Um, uh, my father's 93 years old. He lives in southern New Jersey in the house that he built. And he really doesn't care about his smart meter. Um, he is on Facebook, but that's a whole other issue I don't want to get into. Um, but then you look at the type of, you know, we also serve the capital of the free world. And there's an expectation that we're going to be on the front end of innovation. So we have to manage this evolution in a very deliberate way. And I would say that uh, some companies in our space have in some ways gotten out in front of their headlights in, in maybe hyping what the smart grid could do. And we made a decision to try to do this in a very deliberate, almost a quiet way, and to assure ourselves that this was going to work before we ran into a problem that could have actually exploded in, in front of us from a from a bad public relations point of view. And I think we've been fairly successful in doing that. Um, so pace is very, very important. It's, it's, it's an opportunity to work with our regulators, with our political leaders, to understand where we're trying to go. And I think the next phase of our work uh, is going to also have to entail a, a, a very broad policy issue around cybersecurity. You put a smarter grid in place, you're providing for more information that can be provided. Uh, and that's, a, that's, a, that's going to be a big issue for us as an industry to wrestle down uh, more broadly, but it is, I think, very much associated with having a smarter grid. So they're the kind of the things that we think about as we uh, move on this. Thank you, Joe. Joe, you've had, uh, you know, Sandy recently, derecho was in July, and then we had uh, Hurricane Irene uh, to bring Thanks, up Pete. these good Thanks. thoughts. <laughs> but I think the audience, and I'd be interested sure. in uh, sure. how your, your smart meters uh, work into your restoration um, efforts. If you're, if you're from around this area, I mean, our, our company has been severely criticized, uh, Pep, Pepco. We have two other utilities, Delmarva Power and Atlantic Electric, that have not been pulled into that criticism. Uh, it's important for us to stand up and take accountability for that. Uh, we have a very, very expansive investment program to just improve day-to-day -day reliability, and we are making enormous strides just in what we would call blue, blue sky type outages. It just incredible the, the improvement. We have a long way to go, we're not done. That's not a, it's not mission accomplished yet. But the moments of truth for us, the real tests are, are when we have storms. And I would give maybe three distinct experiences going back to Hurricane Irene in August. Uh, the good thing about a hurricane is you know it's coming and you can prepare for it. And candidly, we over prepare. Uh, we had a very good experience. And in, our, in the state of Delaware, where we are the most mature in our implementation of the smart grid, we were actually able to go out and ping the meters to know that the customer was back on. Uh, I think Trevor mentioned trouble beyond trouble. Mm -hmm. We refer to that as nested outages. So we think we got the feeder back in, but we would not know, let's say, that your particular meter is not back on because you didn't call us. Well, having this technology in place allows us to go out and actually ping the meter. We also know from what's called the last gasp that the meter is going out. So our ability to use our other systems, our outage management system, our customer information system, has positioned us to be much more responsive to the customer in terms of their information needs. The derecho was a different issue. Uh, we didn't have that knowledge. And candidly, that was a much tougher experience for us, from a, certainly from a media and customer reaction. But a very similar experience of being able to really chunk down on the back end of restoration because, you know, the, at the end of the restoration period, you're dealing with the, one, you know, the onesies and twosies, and that's when customers are very rightly very frustrated when you get to that point. If I bring us up to Sandy, a very good experience for us. We were fortunate in many ways, even though we had 220,000 customers out in Atlantic City Electric. We had only 40,000 out here. We were able to use the technology. Uh, so cumulatively through these three storms, we estimate that we've been able to avoid about 5,700 separate truck rolls. And you think about that, that's going to allow you to marshal those resources much, much more efficiently at the back end of a restoration experience when the frustration level is at the highest. 
We think we have got to a point where when we're in storms like that, we've been able to shave off about a half a day's of, of the overall restoration period and, and candidly have been able to save millions of dollars because we were just much more efficient in the process. So in the moments of truth, when the real tests show up, uh, the smart grid is delivering. That's great. Great. Lisa, as part of your efforts at IE, you travel around the country, you tracking all the different utilities, what they're doing and modernizing the grid. What do you see as the, anything rise to the top, a couple of top things in terms of barriers and what do you think uh, IE can do to help mitigate some of those barriers? Well, I mean, one of the things that, I mean, clearly we've all, everyone has sort of touched on <laughs> is, is the regulatory issue and getting a, a, approval from state regulators, having state regulators be partners in, in deploying the smart grid and having state regulators really be supporters of, of moving forward with some <coughs> of this innovation. I think that's, that's absolute key to the industry because we are a regulated industry. So from, our, from the perspective of IEE, I think one of the roles there is really, IE has an excellent relationship with state regulators in collaboration with EEI. And our role with state regulators is really as an information provider. They see us as a source of information and I think trust the information that we provide. So that's one area where I think IE has, has worked in the past but will continue to work, just really providing an information role for state regulators but also bringing state regulators into a dialogue with our industry. And we've done those things in the past and we'll continue to do those things. But I think there, is, there will continue to be the challenge with regulation. Um, the, a, a second area I think where we can, we can make a difference is really again, bringing together our, the smart grid technology companies like Siemens and our utility industry. We have a management committee of, of, of 22 uh, CEOs from the utility industry. We have a partner roundtable, which was mentioned earlier, of over 25 technology companies, and helping to foster just a discussion <laughs> of emerging issues, solutions, what's working, what's not working. Just the, the, the job of getting all this information in one place is so difficult because there are so many different things going on. Every, I, I listen to d discussions many, many times during the year of this, but just today I'm listening to this discussion and I always learn new things and we all learn new things. So bringing the people together to really foster that collaboration and put the issues on the table, the successes, the failures, how can we do better? I think that's a, a role for IE going forward. Thank you, Lisa. You know, in my opening remarks, uh, Terry, I talked about that a lot of the innovation is invisible to our customers because it's behind the meter. We've talked a lot about the smart meters. But in terms of substations and what's going on with our substations, can you educate us a little bit about what the opportunities are there and what you're seeing, uh, what innovation you're seeing at the substation level and how important that is? Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, the substation is, has a bit been forgotten, I think, in the smart grid hype. We focus on the meters and, and some of the enterprise IT, but the substation is really the intelligent node of the grid and we look at the substation as a, a four quadrant. Uh, protect the grid, that's where you put your protection scheme. Automate, and you need to push automation and controls down to the substation more and more because the you know, PV panels, all, all these new phenomenon on the grid are a much faster phenomenon than we used to. So centralized control is not sufficient you put controls in the substation and you make the substation uh, more intelligent like this. The third quadrant is maintain, maintain the asset, bring information about the asset, translate that information into um, asset performance indices. And the fourth, uh, uh, as was mentioned before, is secure. How do you implement cyber secure substation and, and really blind the grid against cyber attack? So four quadrant, protect, automate, maintain, and secure. And, and what's great is that um, standards have matured. There's a fundamental standard called the IEC 61850, which enables those smart substation uh, to become a lot more flexible and, and to be able to evolve with, with the needs of the, the grid. Thank you. Well, before we go to uh, our questions from our audience, uh, so get, get ready and prepare. We'll have one more and, and uh, I want to follow back on this theme that Lisa talked about in terms of regulation. 
and with your background, you have a unique perspective than, uh, than the rest of us here. And, and what do you see we can do to get regulation innovation more in lockstep? Sure. Well, there are, are challenges, and we have long-term responsibilities uh, as a company. We're 100 years old. As an industry, we're, we're even older than that. Uh, I like to, uh, again, uh, work with regulators so that they're uh, thinking about uh, the industry, thinking about what we do, not just as kind of vehicles to implement policy and not just uh, in terms of, of rates or keeping rates down, but thinking about uh, what do regulators need to do to uh, promote the ongoing investment in the basic infrastructure. And these are issues that we've all uh, dealt with. And at the same time, uh, support uh, prudent, thoughtful uh, investments in forward-looking technologies. And I think typically we're all taking an approach that's not, wouldn't be characterized as overly risky uh, or as bet the farm, but understanding how uh, new technologies uh, can be deployed as we upgrade and advance the existing infrastructure. You can't do that effectively if uh, you are, are, are focused exclusively on managing down costs at the expense of reliability, at the expense of innovation. Uh, and, uh, and fundamentally, I think one of our challenges is to, to really invite regulators, invite policymakers in to understand what we're doing, uh, get them out to the substations, get them to the control centers, be as transparent as we can about uh, our systems, how they work, how we think about them, how we're planning for their modernization. Thank you, Bob. Before we go to the questions, uh, the rules is that I'm the moderator, so obviously I can't be asked a question. But with that, um, <laughs> I see we do have uh, someone who has a question for us from the audience. Just state your name. And Hi, I'm Brett Brun from uh, Smart Grid Today. So I have two questions. Um, run, the first is for Mr. Rigby, really. Uh, when you talk about avoiding you know, almost 6,000 truck rolls, um, how do you make that a valuable uh, proposition to the customers who everyone's talking about? Because it's really kind of inside baseball. Mm -hmm. And so wouldn't they actually rather see trucks rolling and helping them? You know, There's kind of an um, intellectual disconnect there because right. visibility is lacking, and that's a good thing. But how do you, how do you um, translate that? Well, let me be clear when I said about what the truck rolls. They're, they're rolling. They're just not going to a location that we would have otherwise thought there was an outage. Mm -hmm. So in fact, you know, we have a, we have, we've avoided incurring a cost, which you know, over the last three storms have probably gone north of $4 million. But the customers that are actually out are seeing the truck rolls. So I don't want you to think that, that, that there's an elimination of, of, of the work it's just going to where it really is needed. Does that help? I'm not sure if it helps me. I'm not concerned about helping okay. me. I'm, I'm talking okay. about <laughs> how you val translate the value of um, you know, avoided uh, work, unnecessary work, to the customers who everyone's talking about right. who don't really get the smart grid. As well, you know, I, I think that part of the issue you're getting at is how do we really communicate you know, what's going on in the smart grid? And we have found when we're talking to reporters, when I'm talking to the governor of the state of Delaware, that he's, he's getting that message and it is in fact getting to our customers. So I'm, I feel like the communication is in fact in place and that message is getting out to, to our customers that, that this, this thing we call the smart grid is in fact delivering a value beyond just the day-to-day -day operational savings. Okay. And the other question is for everybody. Um, in terms of the regulators, what's going to happen in the next six months to change the situation so that they, you know, begin, a much larger number of them begin to understand the technology and the prospects? Why six months? Yeah, why? <laughs> because time is of the essence. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. right. um, yeah. so the world is you can wait for another year, but it's just going to make and it And you're worse. on deadline. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are there things in place? It's nice to talk about it, but right. what's going to happen in the next six months or a year, whatever you choose? You know? what, what perspective I have on that, I said in the opening comments, is that uh, we, 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 you know, we tried, uh, try to continue to stress that we're really at the start of this uh, journey we're on. I mean, we're really in the beginning. Investment's the first part. And you, if you hear and listen to the panel, what we're now doing is really figuring out whether it's you know, through power restorations, through ordinary operations, through reliability, 
through getting all this data we haven't had in the past, through driving analytics and figuring out how to reduce fraud, what have you, how to prove up the value of these investments. And I think in the next six months, in the next 12 months, and there's a lot of, every utility we're taking the, some of a different approach, and that's valid because we all have different situations. And if we prove up those values, whether, you know, it's a better customer in our case, much highest customer satisfaction we've ever had uh, in terms of, you know, better power restoration, better customer experience, in terms of savings from operations, cost savings, which we're delivering. Those are the types of things, and they're concrete examples of value that can be pointed to. We'll start to get the regulators more and more on board, that's in my opinion. Can I offer, uh, we, we're, we're right in the process of um, uh, either having wrapped up a series of rate cases or beginning a series of rate cases. Uh, the case we just settled uh, this past week in the state of Delaware uh, actually involved the recovery of smart grid dollars. So part of interacting with the regulator is to get in front of them and actually have to prove your case. Uh, so, you know, they're going to rightly put us through our paces to get recovery of those dollars. We're at a point in my service territories where in our different, in front of our different regulators, the, the next series of rate cases is actually going to involve the cash recovery of these investments and we're going to obviously need to interact and, and basically prove the business plan or the, the business case that we put in front of them uh, several years ago when we started on this. I want to add a, a, just a quick um, point also. I mean, one of the challenges that we face, I think, just to go back to your original question, I think we have a lot of informed regulators, but we also have a, regula a state regulatory environment that changes quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So one of our jobs is to keep informing the new people that are coming in. And that's, we do that on, a, on an ongoing <coughs> basis. Our utilities are, are doing that um, with their own state regulators. Um, IEE is doing that through the, the uh, NARUC uh, meetings every you know, every four months, basically, we're, we're meeting with regulators, we're holding discussions, we're holding dialogues. But it's an ongoing challenge because state regulators change about every, at the average tenure, I think, is five years. So um, the education process is ongoing, but I would say we, have, we do have a lot of informed regulators, but we also have a new, lot of new regulators. But what I would add to that, at the uh, national level, uh, both IEE and EEI uh, have lots of activities focused on uh, providing what we consider to be high quality, uh, fact-based information about technology, uh, about finance, which uh, is, is fundamental to uh, all of this, uh, and supporting uh, fora where uh, consumer advocates, uh, regulators, uh, industry leaders can all come together to talk through uh, some of these issues much longer term. At the company level, uh, the contested cases are important, but I always think of contested cases if you remember college or high school philosophy as the allegory of the cave, where you're looking at the shadows and not seeing uh, what necessarily is real. So one of the things we try to do, again, is, is encourage our, our regulators to get out and uh, walk around, visit with our employees directly. But we also are very aggressive about uh, putting on substantive uh, informational meetings outside the context of a rate case where we're not kind of bearing the burden of suspicion because we're in front of you asking for something. We're in talking about what we're doing. We have a, a meeting with our South Dakota regulators, in fact, scheduled uh, for next week. Uh, we like to, in our Montana operation, typically come in and do a deep dive on one particular aspect of the business, uh, a briefing on transmission issues, a briefing on finance issues, a briefing on distribution, uh, even uh, uh, customer care. And uh, providing those kinds of opportunities, I think, is, 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 is tremendous. Fundamentally, what I would like us to all be able to get to is a point where uh, we, our customers, our investors, and our regulators uh, will still have disagreements over the small things uh, step by step, but where there's a fundamental alignment uh, of interests and a, a shared vision looking out uh, 20, 30, or 40 years. And that's important as to the state regulators. It's also very, very important uh, as to the FERC and the federal regulators, and because all of us are uh, regulated, uh, not just in terms of economic regulation, but environmental regulation, securities regulation, uh, we, have, uh, we have an awful lot of accountability, and as much as we can take those consistent approaches uh, across the business, across uh, all of our different constituencies, the better off we are. 
Thank you, Bob. Let's take our, our next question from the audience. <laughs> yeah, well, since everybody was talking about regulators, <laughs> I thought I could. I'm Betty N. Kane. I'm chairman of the uh, Public Utility Commission here in the District welcome. of Columbia. So welcome to our jurisdiction. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, comment on any case that's before us. But I, I, you've all made the point. I think we have a lot of uh, educated and informed regulators, and there's a lot going on. When I leave here, I'm going back to another conference across the uh, across the city on renewable portfolio standards and how to integrate that. I think that, that there's a challenge is getting to the customer on that, because we're kind of in the middle. And you know, this is one of the ways to do it. Well, while Joe was talking, I was looking up my hourly Pepco usage from <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> and the more we can get, particularly the younger generation, to understand the value you know, of what we've approved and, and what, what they're paying for. I did have a question, um, because we have really two different kinds of, I'd say, electric utilities uh, in, in this country, vertically integrated and then unbundled or restructured. And what we're talking about here is, is the distribution and the transmission system. Um, have you all seen any difference in the, the flexibility, the ability of a company that can concentrate solely on distribution, on meters, on, on the infrastructure uh, versus a company that also has to or runs power plants, the generation, the supply, either from being more, more nimble or from one way or the other having more resources to do this. Um, this is a, you know, restructuring was done to produce customer choice. That was the theory of it when it happened. But I'm just wondering in this whole new environment, where we're really talking about the need to innovate in not the, the power supply or the production, but in the distribution system, whether there's any advantages or experiences one way or the other. We probably have some different, I'm vertically integrated, Joe. Uh, we're on bundled, but you know, uh, I'm, I'm feeling an enormous amount of pressure because my, my, uh, my, my chairman is here. <laughs> Plus I also have to admit that one of my board members is in the audience, so I'm feeling a lot of, but let me, let me, let me take a shot at that. Um, <laughs> Uh, this, this region of the world uh, deregulated uh, about 12 years ago, 10, uh, maybe even longer than that. Um, I would say in terms of our experience, um, we found ourselves in around 2007 looking at uh, the need to make an enormous amount of infrastructure investment north of $5 billion. Uh, we had a relatively small merchant generation fleet. It was about 4,000 megawatts. Uh, and we made a strategic decision to just focus on, on wires, poles, and pipes. So I, I think to the, to the chair's question, I would say that for our experience, when we sold those assets in uh, 2010, it has been easier to align the focus and the brain power um, and the business plan of the organization uh, around just this type of infrastructure. So I would say in our experience, it's probably been net overall, it's been, it's been a, a, a real positive. Yeah, I just want to counterpoint to that. I think it's a, it would be a simplification to say that that really has any uh, merit on your, if you're going to be more focused on the customer. And our point, we are vertically integrated, and I'll make a point that in terms of customer engagement, I think Lisa can attest to this, uh, we're probably doing more on customer engagement we have 40,000 programmable thermostats in homes that we're sending real price signals that I don't think anybody else has. And so we just went into it really focused on customer engagement, although we have power plants. And the other thing I'll tell you is that a big part of our business case is demand response. And as a vertically integrated company, we can capture that value because that means like, so this summer we uh, save 65 megawatts based on our 40,000 programmable thermostats and the demand response, we reduced our peak load by 65 megawatts. And that's just the start. We're trying to get up to over about 300. Um, we can capture that value because we're vertically integrated. If you don't own the generation, you really don't get that value. And so I, I think there's a lot of things that we can do and that tying in how we optimize our generation with how we optimize customer usage that when I talked about customers use it wisely, we produce it wisely, is true. And I think there's things that vertically integrated utilities can do with the smart grid technology that uh, companies in deregulated markets cannot do. And I think you may see more innovation from here, I'm speaking to my board members, from a <laughs> vertically integrated company, at least on, on our part, than, than maybe when it's separated. So I don't think can, we can make a simplifying statement that one's better than the other. Uh, 
have, have kind of a, an interesting situation where our South Dakota operation, uh, relatively uh, conservative approach to public policy and regulation, vertically integrated. Uh, our customers on the electric side have had uh, essentially flat nominal rates, which means decreasing uh, real rates for three decades. Now there's some environmental compliance expenses uh, that will be coming due over the next several years. On our Montana operation, uh, did go through supply uh, deregulation and ultimately divestiture uh, on uh, gas and electric both. Uh, I don't think uh, Montanans are terribly happy with the results. So now we have uh, authority, actually both electric and gas, uh, to reintegrate. We are reintegrating uh, both building uh, and acquiring uh, generation in ways that make sense uh, for our, our customers. And our I think, experience is very much similar with yours. Again, different regions, different companies, uh, different environments, uh, but we see an awful lot of opportunities on both sides of the meter as we uh, remain integrated on our South Dakota side and move uh, relatively more towards integration on our Montana side. Can we move to our, our last question from the audience? Hi, my name is Kent Leacock. I'm with Acorn Energy. Um, I guess my question is kind of a two-part question in that you, you made the comment about uh, utilities getting ahead of their headlights. None of you have done that, yeah. but there have been a number of instances around the country where smart meters were not well received and in fact all of a sudden smart meters became the de facto smart grid. So how, how did smart meters become the grid, even though they're at the end, <laughs> and then how do you make that transition if you want to have additional innovation at, for example, the substation level or other, other pieces of the actual grid? How do you make that transition to that in the mindset of your customers already thinking that they've got the smart grid now, that they have this smart meter installed on their home, and then linking that with the regulator's kind of nervousness about additional, you know, innovation built into their, into the rates of the people that think they already have the smart grid? That's a good question. <laughs> um, who wants to, uh, well, can we I, take Siemens, who doesn't have a utility? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Answer that one yeah, Just one, one aspect is that once a uh, utility has deployed smart meters, they're getting a lot of information, a lot of data. They're also getting a gateway to the, the premise and that, that opens the door for justifying more investment. Uh, we talk about grid analytics, for example. That's the correlation between what the meters tell you with what the grid is doing. And you can actually make decisions uh, that you could not do before by having this additional information. We, we've done some, uh, actually, there will be a press release tomorrow with, with Centerpoint in Texas, where we correlated their meter data, two million meters, every 15 minutes and within 24 hours by the next morning you have a very accurate view of the load on your grid of the day before so you can justify you know assets that are overloaded maybe replacing those or maybe uh, you know you can do some some more so use the smart meters as a as a first step if you already have them my, my answer to that would be that it gets back to proving up some of the value for example we talk about power restoration and Joe was talking about when the, you know, we know who customers are out, you know, before they do in some cases. Uh, and uh, in, in our cases, you know, if you can, uh, we do remote disconnects and connects. And uh, the experience we're having now, we have 100, so we have 800,000 customers. We have 100,000 customers that are basically managing and paying the bill on kiosks all over the city. And so in their instance, they, um, Unfortunately, if their power goes off because they didn't pay their bill, they go to the 7-Eleven, run their credit card through the kiosk before they get home, power's back on. So they're starting to, they're seeing other things. And, the, and, and power restoration, and, and I don't think customers, if we talk about substations, their eyes are, they're going to glaze over. <laughs> right. They want to see, right. you know, value. And so when we start on, on power restoration, when we have the technology out in the system where not only do we know somewhere, someone's out, but we know where the fault is. And we can pinpoint that fault. We know what kind of fault it is. You don't have to send out somebody to access. You don't have to send somebody out to go walk lines. You know exactly where it is. You know exactly where the problem is. Your power restoration times will come down a lot. And so when we be able to show, you know, you have a much better customer experience, then I think they'll, 
that's the only way that I think that I can see to really connect with the customer on that is to show them, you know, show me the money, show, show the value for the investment. With that, I think I want to thank the, the panel for the participation and the great questions from the audience, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Bob Rowe for concluding remarks. Bob? Pete, thank you very much. You did a tremendous job uh, really bringing order out of the chaos of this very, very complicated topic. And thank you to uh, all of the panelists for the superb contributions you make. And then especially, Lisa, thanks to you, uh, but not only you, also to your uh, extraordinary staff uh, at IEE and uh, to the whole EEI family for supporting uh, this effort and lots of other uh, uh, great works for uh, the member companies uh, and indeed for all of our all of our customers uh, as well. Well, I know everyone is very uh, very busy, so taking uh, time out of your busy days to join us here is not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, but uh, you obviously appreciate the exciting things that are, are going on. We had great uh, great questions, great discussions uh, from the audience. So your participation is very much appreciated as well. Uh, innovation, efficiency, electricity. Uh, we're broadening IEE's uh, mission from narrowly looking at energy uh, efficiency on the customer side of the meter to addressing how energy uh, productivity is now integrally related to the traditional and to the evolving utility uh, functions. Uh, the innovative technology that we've discussed coupled with uh, our ongoing investment in the basic uh, infrastructure uh, really are transforming the power grid uh, and making it more reliable. Uh, more efficient and more productive. And these technologies are also opening the door to managing energy in ways that we really haven't seen before. Uh, IEE's uh, role uh, will, be, will be broadened uh, within the industry uh, to include uh, addressing uh, innovative technologies, e efficient technologies, uh, producing the, uh, the forums and the discussions uh, such as today's and the compelling uh, research and reports that are going to be needed. Uh, it's going to be exciting. Uh, and I hope that everyone here this morning uh, does uh, uh, share in and, and feel that excitement as well. So you heard about digital communication, sensors, control systems, uh, meters that are setting the stage uh, for the transformation of the power grid and how these new technologies uh, will improve grid optimization and energy management in ways that we really haven't, uh, haven't seen before. So although technology has always been important uh, in our industry, uh, it has also always been the case uh, that people are, are even more important, and that's the people we serve uh, and also the dedicated uh, people who provide that service, including uh, the uh, thousands and thousands of, of linemen and utility employees uh, who responded just over the last month, including uh, uh, people from, from my company uh, to help with uh, the recovery after Sandy. Uh, utilities are on a path to transform the nation's power grid, to evolve the grid, uh, and with it, how we uh, generate, deliver, and use electricity, uh, re each doing it in ways, as you heard, that make sense uh, for our customers, for our regions, and for the evolution of our existing networks. Very importantly, we're all working to understand and incorporate uh, new technologies where it makes sense, again, deployment at the speed of value, while we continue to invest in the reliability, uh, safety, adequacy, and resiliency of the basic uh, infrastructure that still provides the essential foundation for serving our customers. Well, utilities uh, can't do it alone. Uh, as you heard, uh, to make the transformation possible, there are important roles for regulators, policymakers, entrepreneurs, uh, technology companies, and other stakeholders, and especially our customers. I would ask uh, all of you to strike from your active vocabulary uh, the word ratepayer. If it ever made sense, it certainly doesn't make sense now uh, as we think about the kind of engagement that we all need to have with our customers and that our customers, uh, including the chair of the uh, District of Columbia Commission, uh, expect right now. Uh, uh, the customer really is the most uh, critical stakeholder in our energy future. Ultimately, what customers uh, demand will unlock the future, the, uh, the full potential of this future and, and will drive innovation and change. Utilities are regulated, soup to nuts, by state and federal regulators. They, the regulators, create the environment in which we earn, or sometimes under-earn, uh, an appropriate uh, return and help us think through uh, how we time and target uh, our investments. Their decisions drive whether and on what terms 
Uh, we will have access uh, to equity and debt capital. This is true for ongoing investment in the foundational infrastructure that we all discussed this morning, as well as for investment in appropriate new technologies. Uh, Pete did a great job of highlighting uh, how important regulation is as he introduced the uh, 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 morning. And again, we all, we all came back to this uh, subject throughout the discussion. Uh, we're very excited through IEE and elsewhere to continue developing strong partnerships uh, with technology companies such as Siemens and many others. And this is an area where IEE really is already making a difference, bringing together uh, key stakeholders to find solutions to some of our most important problems. As you know, all of you know, our world is increasingly dependent on electricity. The typical American home now has, on average, about 25 uh, electronic d devices, and about 99% of those uh, have to be plugged in or recharged at, at some point. Uh, in my home, I think we have about 50 devices, and about 150% of those have to be plugged in or recharged. Uh, but our homes are, are actually getting uh, more efficient all the time. Lots of credit uh, for that goes to the existing utility efficiency and demand side programs. Uh, but uh, we're also all relying uh, much more on electricity. Today, electricity derives most, uh, most every aspect of our lives, and I'm confident that electricity uh, will, will enhance everyone's life uh, well into the future. So therefore, uh, it's up to us to design, to build uh, the innovations that will keep our nation and ultimately the world uh, supplied with secure, reliable, uh, affordable, and increasingly clean energy. Uh, smart grid technologies and innovations uh, yet to be introduced will transform our energy-consuming world in ways we can't even imagine now. Uh, but one thing is certain, though, and that, again, is the need, fundamentally, to engage the customer. So, in closing, I'd like to frame our collective challenge uh, this way. Uh, first, uh, think of the goal as energy productivity, which I think may be a better way to capture what we are about uh, than efficiency. Second, uh, think of the utility as providing uh, and enabling energy services uh, in addition uh, to providing the physical energy infrastructure. Third, develop public policies uh, that support utility business models and operational models that are consistent with providing both energy services and uh, investment in essential infrastructure while meeting obligations to all of our stakeholders, including first and foremost customers, our shareholders, uh, our uh, employees and, and policymakers. Fourth, uh, develop those utility uh, business models and operating models uh, that get the job done efficiently, uh, profitably, and, uh, and dynamically. And fifth and finally, again, listen to our customers, pay attention to uh, uh, what they want, uh, what their experiences are as we do unroll the technology. So. Uh, thanks again uh, uh, to all of you for joining us this morning. I know that IEE, innovation, electricity, and efficiency uh, will play a critical role in informing our energy future, and this is truly just the beginning. Uh, the panel will be here for the next 15 minutes or so, and they will be happy to uh, answer all of your questions, and in this case, that will include Pete. Good. So thank you for joining us.